Hi, I'm Claire. Let me just boot up my operating system here. There we go. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the grandmothers of the internet. And I know it's early, and I know I'm first, so I'm going to try to set the mood, keep the energy high, and anchor us in some very necessary historical context. So <clears throat> these things take a while. OK, yes. This is me. Mm. Old technology, yes. This is me dressed like Steve Jobs. Pretty much still. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here in Malmo. This is such a wonderful and thoughtful conference, clearly, and uh, you are all such wonderful and thoughtful people, so I will do my best to honor you. Um, I care a lot about women, and I care a lot about technology. I care a lot of them, about them ideally together, and these are my bona fides. This is, this is how I feel qualified to talk about this. I'm a woman, <laughs> and I grew up on the computer, like probably almost everyone here. I never felt when I was a kid that computers were for boys or for girls any more than I thought the toaster or the television was for boys or for girls. It was just an appliance in the home. I was fortunate my father worked for Intel, so we had computers in the home for as long as I can remember, and I obviously glommed onto them really early. This is a video that I insisted my father take of me when I beat the CD-ROM game Myst. Does anyone remember this game? It made it over here. Which, I mean, now with like two decades in the rear view, I have, uh, I'm not too proud to say that I beat this game because I found a cheat on the World Wide Web and I just executed it exactly <laughs> like on the paper because I was driven insane by this game. Anyway, this is just to say that I've always loved computers. And when the web came along when I was a kid, it was a good time to discover the World Wide Web. I was young enough that I was full of optimism and possibility, and I found the web to be the most exciting thing that had ever happened to me in my life. It was a place where I could learn about myself, learn about others, make connections, explore, discover. It was a place I was proud to call my home. It was a place that felt like my home. I felt like the web was my country, my domain, and that was a big part of my identity growing up and into my adulthood. But something happened to me, and maybe also to the web, uh, as I grew older, and it stopped feeling that way. It stopped feeling like my country. It stopped feeling safe uh, or fun uh, for me as a person, but also, more importantly, perhaps, as a woman. So I began to ask myself three or four years ago, had it ever been my country, or was I just naive as a child? So I spent three years looking for answers, mostly just searching for um, you know, some kind of lineage that might include somebody like me, you know, uh, founding mothers and grandmothers, foremothers, people that I could point to and say, we have been here all along. And I found them, by the way, they exist. There's so many of them. It's obscene how many of them there are. Um, Lots and lots and lots of fascinating older women uh, who I got to talk to about their experiences in the early computing industry and on the first waves of the World Wide Web. And I found those four mothers and I found that country. But I also found something else. Uh, I think something arguably more important, which is like the seeds of a different future. I cannot tell you how many times in the course of my research I found myself reading about a technology or an approach to technology that just had it been implemented at the right time in history, had it had funding, had it had support, would have fundamentally changed uh, the systems in which we operate today, possibly, most likely, for the better. Um, so these women that I've encountered while writing the book, they're not just like role models or heroes or grandmothers, they're actually glimpses at another way of being, at another possibility that's latent and hidden within our own history that we can still take today if we just choose to. Let me give you an example. So, this is a woman named Stacy Horn. She, when this photo was taken in the late 1980s, early 1990s, she had just founded a very, very early social network. Um, back in those days, a social network before the web was most likely a bulletin board system or a BBS. Has anyone ever dialed into a BBS? Okay, all right. Basically, it's a text window that you called on the telephone and paid for by the hour. It was like a text-based message board system. The very first social spaces on the internet were BBS systems. There was one really popular BBS on the west coast of the Bay Area, the US, called The Well, that's very often cited in computer history as being like the beginning of social media online, because it had all these famous hippie computer guys like Stuart Brand uh, involved in the conversation. But Stacy logged onto The Well, and she didn't like it, because she lived in New York. And in those days, there was still kind of a big cultural difference between the internet on the west coast and the internet on the east coast, because it cost more, more money to phone, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, 
she was a New Yorker, like dyed in the wool through and through, Gen X, 90s New Yorker, very cynical, very media oriented, not at all interested in computer culture or technology. She wanted to get online in order to meet people and talk to people. She didn't want to talk about computers once she got online. So she decided to start her own system, which when she founded it, she called Echo, the East Coast Hangout. Now, <laughs> Obviously, it was great. You can just tell right away that it was great. Um, it was very New York. It was populated by writers and media people, journalists, um, you know, musicians, the sort of New York downtown scene. And it was very cynical, and it had lots of sort of funny quirks, lots of things that were very unique about it. One being, for example, that she didn't host it in some kind of like garage in Palo Alto or you know, in some well-funded VC startup somewhere. She hosted it in her own apartment building uh, on a stack of servers and modems surrounded by you know, Gumby figurines and photos of friends and loose pieces of paper. It's a very domestic kind of internet space. In fact, there it is. And there's Stacy. And that's all interesting as a piece of internet history. But it had something else really, really interesting about it. So in those days, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, the population of women on the internet was vanishingly small, like maybe 10, 15%. We don't have good numbers on it, but it was mostly men online. But Echo, pretty much out of the gate, had a 40% female user base. So it was one of the first places on the internet to be even remotely hospitable to women. It was a place where women could actually find one another and talk, because oddly enough, in those early internet days and early social spaces on the web, I mean, pre-web, when a woman signed on, and she was such a, mi and a, such a minority, she would immediately get harassed and bothered. So a lot of women used gender neutral or male pseudonyms when they were navigating the early internet, and because of that, it was genuinely hard for women to find one another. So Echo was kind of a lifesaver. It was one of the first places where women could actually talk to each other on the internet and talk to men. Everyone talked together. It was wonderful. Um, now, a lot of people at the time characterized this as, oh, she's creating a safe space for women. And that wasn't at all Stacy's intention. She said, bite me. It's very 90s. I wanted more women on Echo to make it better. Now, she wasn't creating some kind of refuge for a vulnerable population. She wasn't making a safe space. She was trying to make her entire service better. She understood that diversity isn't just some favor that you do to the underrepresented. It's something that brings benefit to the entire community at large. Stacy was a businesswoman too. I mean, she was charging for this service, and the service that she was charging for was dynamic, interesting conversation with New York's finest intellectuals. And you can't have that if you're only presenting a really monocultural view. She knew more women, more perspectives, more conversation, better product. Seems obvious, right? It wasn't at the time. Now, she was able to do this because she was the only person who actually tried <laughs> to find women to bring online, because she would recruit people from non-technical spaces. She wouldn't go to the Homebrew Hacker Computer Club and try to get users. She would go to art galleries in New York. She would go to shows. She would go to poetry slams. She would go anywhere she thought interesting people were congregating and try to convince them to do, at the time, the unthinkable thing of buying a modem and getting on her service. She would do things like make access free for women for an entire year, give sections of her service over to women's magazines and women's groups. She would go and speak to women's groups. She taught Unix classes in her apartment so that a lack of technical knowledge would not be an inhibition for people who wanted to get online for the very first time. She made private spaces on the service where women could talk to one another uh, and report instances of harassment if necessary, but also just talk, talk the way women talk when women are together. Here she is um, teaching a um, public television host in the US how to use Echo in the mid-1990s. <laughs> but her main strategy beyond all this outreach was baked into the design of the service. So back in those days, all online communities were moderated by hosts, which is something that we still see on some places of the internet, right? Reddit is moderated by hosts. But most moderation in the modern world has been kind of outsourced to traumatized contract workers in you know, Florida and the Philippines who are dealing with uh, all the worst of humanity. But back in those days, social communities were small enough that they were able to sort of deputize their own users to take care of themselves. So every community in the early social spaces of the internet had hosts that were like party hosts, you know, people that would introduce people to one another and make sure conversation was going smoothly and solve problems and you know, trigger conversation. Totally normal, but on Echo, there were always two hosts. There was always a man and a woman for every single conversation, which meant, effectively, that when women came online to use her service, 
they would find themselves immediately part of the conversation. They would not be inhibited by anything because they would see themselves reflected in the power structure and in the culture of this place. It's a very simple thing called representation, right? But it really, really worked. It meant that women automatically jumped into the fray instead of lurking. Now, Echo still exists today. This is exactly what it looks like. It is still a text-based service. It is one of the oldest continuously operating online communities in the world. And if you want to get an account, you have to actually send away in the mail for a letter that comes, which is, I always say it's like millennial proof. There's no way. But it's a really interesting historical archive, too, because there's just this endless repository of conversation dating back to 1989 about everything you could possibly imagine, you know, Star Trek and 9-11 and culture and politics. It's going to be very important one day. And it's managed to survive in this very sort of minimal way because Stacy never sold, she never IPO'd, she never advertised, she never expanded. When the World Wide Web arrived in the mid-1990s, she just didn't have enough money to make a website or a web interface for her service. And so she kept it as it was, a you know pay-by-the-hour or pay-by-the-month, I think, text-based community. And because of that, it's managed to sort of slip under the radar and survive beyond many, many, many other social communities. It's interesting in that way. But Stacey never got rich, she never got famous, um, she never is remembered as being an important founder of social networking, even though she came up with a lot of the sort of social protocols of moderation. But her, accomplish remains, her accomplishment remains massive to me. I think she's heroic because she achieved gender parity on an almost completely male-dominated internet um, because she cared enough to do that. And her little struggling but beautiful social community has managed to stay online for the entire history of the World Wide Web uh, because she's cared enough to keep it that way. And that's a word that we don't really hear a lot in relation to technology anymore, care, right? When we say that people care about something in tech, we usually mean caring about in the sense of like investing lots of money and time and stress into the, the exciting proposition of a new startup. Uh, it means investing without promise of remuneration in the possibility of making something insanely great, as Steve Jobs would have said. It's not usually caring after or caring for, right? That's what Stacy's legacy represents to me, not caring about, but caring for, caring after. And that, that kind of care, that sort of continuing the legacy of care beyond the exciting early moments of a startup and into the tedious workaday actual lived realities of a technology once it's already been built. That's not the kind of thing that we glamorize very often, but it's arguably much more important. And of course, you know, this is something our culture tends to associate with women and in Silicon Valley at least, you know, areas of tech which orient around care, things like moderation and user support and user experience sometimes tend to be filled with women who, you know, most people in their workplaces do not think have technical jobs, right? It's not seen as being a technical job to care about things. <laughs> but, you know, the way I see it, care is a very technical skill because software is a mechanism by which human beings facilitate tasks for other human beings. And in order to do that effectively, you have to understand the task. You have to understand the mental model of people approaching that task. You have to be able to translate the messy realities of human life into code. You have to determine whether your tool solves a problem or simply creates more problems. You have to look beyond metrics like you know, user growth and engagement and stickiness and think about things like mental health and community and civic life and society at large. And social skills are essential in all of that. And by social skills, I don't mean like getting along with people. I mean being able to see a technological object as fully enmeshed and entangled in a social context, in a world full of people, and ultimately I mean caring about those people. Now I know that something like Echo, as beautiful as it is, can never realistically compete with its inheritors. But I still keep coming back to Stacy's story again and again because it represents for me this great lost opportunity in technology, you know, one of these different futures that we've left behind. Like, what if the architects of our present day social media networks actually put the kind of investment into outreach and representation and simple care into the services that they built? You know, what if those values, what if that approach was central to the way we built things at the outset? rather than patched on to the things that are already broken after people have already been hurt. Would I be standing here talking about how the internet doesn't feel like my country anymore? No, I don't think so.
And the thing is, Stacy is a great example, but she's not an outlier, because if you are looking for women in the history of technology, it helps to look where people are especially cared for, where users are especially cared for, to look in those places where form gives way to function, where metrics give way to meaning, and where capital gives way to community. I'm going to give you another example. This is Wendy Hall, Dame Wendy Hall. She was given the female equivalent of a knighthood in 2006 uh, for her contributions to computer science. But when this photo was taken, she was still a lecturer at the University of Southampton in the UK. And she had studied mathematics. That was her field, pure mathematics. She wasn't really that into computers or computer science. But one day, she discovered this thing called hypertext. Now, we think about hypertext now as being something that is fundamental to the web, right? The web is built in a hypertext markup language, studded with hypertext links. But hypertext is a discipline that predates the web by a considerable amount of time. Basically, since the early 1960s, in fact, hypertext has been the study and practice of connecting text, images, multimedia documents of all kinds together with one another through links in closed computer systems, right? It was the study, essentially, of turning all of the information that computer memory was beginning to make accessible, turning all of that into actually useful, meaningful knowledge. Um, and as technology progressed and technology became more complex, hypertext became more complex as well, and the implications of hypertext, this idea that we might be able to connect and share all these disparate nodes of human thought, perhaps all of them, all together in one big intertwingled mess, became something of a utopian cause in some corners of Silicon Valley, and remains so. But Wendy had been turned onto hypertext by this like, very interesting anachronistic computer system that the BBC made in the mid-80s called the Domesday Project. Now, I'm not going to get too in the weeds on this, don't worry, but the Domesday Project was a countrywide effort funded by the BBC to digitally document all British life in the mid-1980s. Um, it was released uh, in the form of two digital video laser discs in 1986 and ran exclusively on this um, really bizarre computer system, which is now pretty much completely obsolete. In fact, there's a whole corner of uh, sort of archival studies in, of people trying to rescue these disks because the data is so difficult to access now. But the thing that was interesting about this document is that it included all this multimedia information, stuff like walks through the Brit beautiful British countryside and walks through kind of bleak British cities and maps and user-submitted information from school children all around the country. And all of that stuff was really fascinating, but what really blew Wendy's mind about it was not so much the content, but the way that it was navigated. So the way that Domesday Disk worked was it was a very, very early multimedia hypertext system, hypermedia system. So way before the web taught us to point and click, this system made it possible to navigate a wealth of multimedia material through intuitive movement of the mouse. This was a novel concept at the time. It really blew people away. It made it so much easier to understand and wrap your head around the complexity of all this information that was accessible. It made, perhaps, computers more accessible to people who didn't have a background in computer science or who didn't think that they were interested in computers. All of a sudden, it brought it into another level of comprehensibility. And that's what blew Wendy away about it, because she understood that combined with the emerging personal computer revolution, that these technologies together would bring a great deal of previously inaccessible information into people's homes. Um, it would open up all this knowledge for people, and she thought that that was pretty revolutionary. Her colleagues at Southampton University did not agree with her about that. Um, they told her that there was no future for her in computer science or in her department if she carried on caring about this whole hypertext, hypermedia thing. Fortunately for us, she ignored them, and she decided to build a system that would make it possible for people to navigate library archives and databases using these kind of intuitive point-and-click systems. She started with the archives at her own university's library, but by 1989, her team had built an entire system called Microcosm. This is what it looked like. And just as the World Wide Web would do a few years later, Microcosm made all of this information uh, exciting, dynamic, accessible, usable, uh, alive, adaptable to the user. It was a really revolutionary product. In fact, it wasn't really like the web at all, because in many ways, it was better. Now, I'm sure you all know how the web works, uh, but I'm going to give you a pr primer on the fundamentals regardless. So on the web, this is a website, um, 
Links are embedded in documents. So when you click on something, it takes you to the destination. Um, but that also means that because the links are contextual in this way, if the source or if the destination of a link is changed or goes down for any reason, we get a 404 error, right? It's a very common experience on the World Wide Web. I think the average lifespan of a website is like nine years. So the web is studded with these dead ends, these rotten links. And you know, we take that for granted now, but we do lose a great deal when we get a 404 error because it means that the piece of information about what connected two ideas together, right? The meta data about the connection between these two different things is just gone forever. And that's a huge loss for our culture. It's bad. <laughs> it's a bad system. Um, Wendy's system, Microcosm, structured its links completely differently. So it separated them into a layer that lived on top of the documents rather than embedding in the documents, which effectively meant that um, you could have links that went in more than one direction, for example. You could have links that went to more than one destination. You would never have to worry about a link rotting or getting a 404 error. It wasn't a concept that existed in this system. And it also meant that different links could be layered on the same material depending on the user. So if you were an expert, you would get different links than maybe a novice might get or a child. Effectively, that also meant that the system was built for learning. It was built to be adaptable to people. It was built with a deep love and respect of the meaningfulness of the connection between things. Good. <laughs> And there were lots of systems like this in these days, in the 80s, um, tons coming out of companies like Sun Microsystems and Apple and Xerox and Symbolics. And they were all actually um, built by women. I mean, there were tons of women working in hypertext at this time. There were women in senior positions, if not running the show, on every major hypertext project in the mid-1980s. There's lots of reasons for this. Um, largely, I think it's because hypertext was a very sort of collegial discipline for people who didn't come from a traditional hard computer science background, so you would go to the early hypertext conference in the late 80s and be surrounded by poets and historians and social scientists and humanists, the literati, because hypertext was interesting to anyone who was interested in the nature of making connections and meaning between ideas. It's a very open-ended concept, and you know it manifests in the s on the screen, but it's it's very sort of philosophical as well. And OK, I mean, granted, none of these systems really look like much today. <laughs> I mean, they're not very glamorous. I promise you that they're all important in their own ways, and they're all different from one another. But the important thing that they all had in common was that they all placed value on the meaning of the connections between things, you know, the why of that connection, because from why emerges the most important kind of information. In fact, it was so much what hypertext was about as a discipline that the very first time the World Wide Web was presented in the United States in 1991 at the Hypertext Conference in San Antonio by Tim Berners-Lee, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who's given the uh, male equivalent of a damehood for his contributions to computer science. When he came to the Hypertext Conference in the early 90s to present the World Wide Web, his paper wasn't even accepted to the conference. He came on his own dollar. He brought his $10,000 NextCube computer from CERN by himself in order to demonstrate the web on the sort of demo floor of this hotel where the conference was held. Um, everyone there thought he was a maniac. I mean, if you look at the expressions on the faces of the people, this is the very first time the web was shown in, in the US. This is like the debut of the web. Nobody was impressed, because here was this guy coming out of nowhere um, with absolutely no respect for the discipline and with a system that just would never work, because if all the links were contextual embedded in these documents, then they would just break. And what was, the, what was good about a hypertext system where the links were going to break? It violated sort of fundamental mechanics of the discipline. And here's a sort of like sideways anecdote about this. So the demo period of the World Wide Web, or the, of this, this moment, it was taken place during the demo period. The demo period was after the entire conference. It was at the very end of this long weekend where people had been giving papers and doing panels and plenaries and all that shit. And everybody was exhausted. And nobody was that interested in looking at demos. And also, the demo period was held at the same time as the cocktail hour. <laughs> and, because, and because it was San Antonio, Texas, in the early 1990s, because it was summer, the cocktail hour consisted of a large margarita fountain outside. And so the very first time that the World Wide Web was shown to anyone in the US, to the academic community in the US, 
everybody was outside getting shit-faced on margaritas to the point that this photo includes a little margarita, and you can even see the salt rim and everything. So one of these people like wandered in from outside. Huh? Put their cup down. Um, anyway, I just love that detail, because it just really shows like, how much nobody cared. And it, it's amazing because, obviously, we all know what happened, right? I mean, within a year of this photo being taken, the World Wide Web was the standard because Tim Berners-Lee had the good idea of putting his hypertext system on the backbone of the internet. In 1992, Tim Berners-Lee published the very first image to ever be clicked in a web browser. This photo of Les Horribles Cernet, a four-piece doo-wop band um, from CERN who performed satirical songs about life in the research lab, and this is also a completely tangential detail, but I'm going to show you like 30 seconds of a clip from a Les Horribles Cernet music video because it is the best thing you will ever see today. Ooh, yeah. Can we pump it up? I feel your screen with hearts and roses. I feel your mail file with lovely phrases. They all come back in valid user. You never let me into your computer. They're sitting on a like a crane supercomputer, like the best. Um, it's incredible. I love them. Uh, please do yourself a favor. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do yourself a favor and, and look, look them up on YouTube. There's two really incredible music videos. The other half of this video takes place in the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, anyway, obviously after this right, comes everything else, like the deluge. And by 1994, Tim Berners-Lee was the keynote at the Hypertext Conference. And all of those older systems, like Wendy Hall's incredible microcosm system, they were all effectively gone, a thing of the past. And yes, that's sad, of course. Um, and these are all speculations, all right? I'm going to say this now, you know, infinite untraveled paths. But there's no way for us to know if something like microcosm could have been as important to us as the World Wide Web is today, fundamentally changing the way that we treat systems, information, and each other. Just as there's no way of knowing if Stacey Horn's echo could have been as important to us as other social media systems are today if she'd only had enough capital to build a system on the World Wide Web when it came along. But that doesn't stop me from dreaming about those possibilities, from seeing those possibilities and imagining how they might play out into our world. And that's what I mean about the sort of different futures that these women represent. Their stories demonstrate to me very vividly how many untraveled paths there have been and how many untraveled paths still lie before us. I feel genuinely thrilled to be here among people who seem to see those paths a little bit cl more clearly, you know, who um, seem to value the, the lovely meandering paths that cut across the brutal efficiencies of what we once called the information superhighway. Nothing happens in a vacuum, in tech or anywhere else. Technology never falls fully formed from the sky. It emerges along a continuum of people and ideas. And tech history is so often about solitary genius, you know, Steve Jobs and Tim Berners-Lee and Bill Gates and <laughs> Elon Musk and all these guys. And of, of course, they're interesting and important to history, but they have never been alone. They have always been surrounded by people and ideas. And that's the exciting thing about tech, you know, making big things really does require big communities of collaborative people, but it's also what makes it so difficult to really acknowledge where things come from and to give ourselves the freedom to imagine where things might still could go. And when we don't see the multiplicity of all those things, we leave out a huge part of the story. Um, we make it harder for all those other possibilities from the past to work their magic on the present and make it better. The last thing I want to share with you is, well, hopefully old news to you, but computing has always been a woman's domain. It's you know, sort of falsely understood as being a kind of boys club, at least in the US, but for 200 years, computers literally were people. They were the people that were doing the computational labor that made the emergence of the scientific age possible. It wasn't a thing, it was a job title. And when it became a thing, uh, when the first mechanical computers were invented during the Second World War, um, the people that were hired to operate those computers were the people that had been doing the work already, the human computers, who were all women. They became the first programmers. 
And because software wasn't yet seen as anything more sophisticated or important than you know, patching cables like a telephone operator or handling cards like a secretary or doing math like a computer, it was a job that was given to women by default without thinking. And those women took the work gladly because here was an opportunity to do something with their mathematics educations that was not just teaching or becoming an actuary or a secretary. They were delighted to do it. And in those days, software wasn't a word anyway. I mean, neither was programmer. These women were variably called operators or, or coders, and the job itself had no real definition. In fact, one of the most brilliant of the early programmers, Betty Snyder, who worked on the ENIAC at the University of Pennsylvania during World War II, she called being a programmer being a cross between an architect and a construction engineer, which was a fair enough description of programming, I think, even today. But it was through their work, during the war and after the war, um, that programming became something of its own value, something that was different from just the menial manipulation of hardware, something that was closer to a language or languages, to an art form, to a world-changing, powerful force as important to us as hardware. After the war, a lot of these early computers uh, programmers led the development of what was then called automatic programming, which is just the idea that programmers should be able to step above patching cables and start thinking about their work as part of a larger system uh, in a sort of symbolic way. And they came up with the earliest compilers and assemblers and generators and did the work that ultimately led to the development of programming languages to the evolution of programming as a symbolic art. In the 1960s in the US, women were half of the workforce in computing and earned 40% uh, of computer science degrees at American universities until the mid 1980s, and obviously since then things have changed. It's dipped and continues to dip for various many reasons that we don't need to get into right now. Uh, largely marketing, frankly. Um, technology historians suggest that the professionalization of the discipline is what led to its implicit masculinization, that a change in the sort of educational requirements and credentials necessary to get a job as a programmer created this male-dominant environment which has only been perpetuated through misconception and through images like these, which were <laughs> um, a huge, I mean, Google vintage computer ad. I promise you, you will not see one image that is not violently sexist. Um, this, is like, uh, this is pretty mild, frankly. Um, or products like these, the Honeywell Kitchen computer. Uh, this, is, this is a computer that cost like $20,000 and took two weeks of programming classes to learn how to use, but it was marketed to women as a way of balancing the budgets for the home and figuring out recipes. Language like this, if only she can cook as well as Honeywell can compute. This kind of thing sets a precedent. It lets people know who is supposed to participate in this culture, right? It's pretty obvious. When I was growing up, it was more graphic. It was things like this. Has anyone seen this movie? Weird science, it's about imagery like this, language like this, has created this condition where we sometimes feel like men are somehow natural to computing and women are at best accessories. And that is like straight up propaganda. That is a lie. That is a historical anachronism. And it has nothing to do with the fundamental nature of the tool. I'm not saying technology is neutral, but it's not like, it's not gendered at least. Um, it's not natural, uh, it's not. So if you remember nothing else from this talk, nothing about BBS systems and hypertext and automatic programming and the Honeywell kitchen computer, remember this at least, that if there is a boys club in technology, uh, it is uh, an anachronism. Like it's really a deviation from the historical norm. These photos were taken by an operations manager at a Bell Labs data center in Oakland in 1970, which was at the time developing a state-of-the-art database system. Look at these women. Look at these beautiful, stylish women. This was normal. This was the way things were. This was what tech looked like for a very, very long time. And this misconception that we struggle against today, it took a generation to create it, and it will probably take another generation to fully undo it, to say nothing of breaking it open even further. But I believe strongly that in a technological world, technological histories are important. And if women and girls can see themselves in the DNA of our century's most profoundly transformative technologies, then they can more easily see themselves in its future. And listen, I don't know that much about the future. I study history, but I do know one thing about the future, and that is if we're going to survive it, um, if we're going to restart and do a better job, um, we're going to need all the help that we can get.
Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great, uh, and I think if you're approximately my age, you're on some kind of weird flashback trip because of the <laughs> aesthetics as well. Uh, we're going to have time for questions uh, from, from the audience quite generously, so, so do start thinking about them. I will remind you that a question is recognized by the question mark at the end of the sentence. Um, it's important. And it's an important um, detail. But I have a few to, to warm us up. I guess. And th these are massive questions, obviously, so like, I don't necessarily expect you to have an answer, but I wonder what is the mechanism through which these narratives are chosen? Like, what the hell happened in just one generation to make us forget? How, what is it that was done to these male heroes that, wasn't, that didn't happen to all of these women? Oh, it's a combination of a lot of things. Um, I think there's this thing that happens a lot, I think, and I, I, I'm guilty of, I think we're all guilty of it. You read something that someone somewhat authoritative writes and you assume that it is true because that's what you do. And so one person writes a history, then the next person comes along and says, well, this guy said this, so this must be true. They write a history. Now it's got two people saying that it's true and that it just keeps going forever. So the sort of earliest histories of computing, at least in the US, like the people that wrote the first histories of you know, the ENIAC computer in the early 1950s, those were men, hardware mostly, people that worked on the hardware side of it, who just didn't see or acknowledge the women that were working in their domain. Um, so it wasn't really until the women started telling their own stories that any of the history, the early history really came out. So I think it's sort of the cumulative snowball effect of you know, the way that we historicize things. I also think that, I don't know, I, this is sort of a broad, broad thing, but history tends to belong to the people who claim their space in it, right? I mean, it tends to belong to those people that walk around and say, I'm the greatest. I mean, you, you, we remember Steve Jobs, we remember Bill Gates, we remember these people because they have always iterated and reiterated how important they are. And that's how you do it. That's how you get remembered, is by reminding everyone all the time that you are important. Ultimately, those people are not that great to work with, I don't think, you know? They're not great collaborators, they're not good team players. Uh, and a lot of the women in my book, at least, are people who are just doing the work, right? They're not, try they're not trumpeting their own achievements because they care about what they're doing so deeply. Uh, they're so enmeshed in the work, they're working in teams, they're just trying to make something, or they're just trying to have a good life, or they're just trying to pursue their interests. They're not trying to become heroic. And I think, it, you know, history tends to remember those people that don't do that. And I think that's the role of people who write about and care about these histories and these narratives is to find all the introverts and make sure that their stories are being told because that's the way it is sometimes, also right? perhaps especially in an introvert-friendly sector <laughs> yes, like this one, it's, it's also uh, quite important. But I mean, if we think about Steve Jobs a lot, and I think uh, still it's a, a figure that fascinates me greatly, but we, I, we tend to forget that, of course, he was in a position to have a massive religiously uh, religious feeling press conference yeah. every year, yeah. several times, sometimes a year, yeah. to talk about how great he was. And of course, <laughs> like eventually, that's going to spend make some kind of mark. On yeah, and I think I mean I say this a lot, but I think the alternative to like a great man version of history isn't necessarily a great woman version of history. I mean, I think we need a lot of correctives to be put in place. But the thing is that the way history works, it's not about individuals. It really isn't. I mean, you can't do anything all by yourself, and especially in this domain where there's so much to be done and so many large teams working together to keep things afloat and large communities of users as well. Um, you know, I think the users are as implicit, complicit in the creation of the technologies that they use as the people that make them. It's a very sort of fluid universe. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's, it's important for us to remember that it's never really about the individual to begin with, be that individual male or female. As somebody with a background in the media, I'm, I'm like, yes, but those stories are so difficult to tell. I know, it's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible. And even, I mean, in the, even in writing this book, I mean, when I first started writing, I, was, I basically wrote an encyclopedia. Like, I just wrote a list of names because there were so many people that needed to be included in this narrative that hadn't been included in other narratives. And it really is, like, unreadable. You know, you couldn't, it's not fun to read a s list of names. It's important, perhaps. I mean, we should do a monument. But if you're gonna write a book, you need to tell stories that people will connect with. So really all the women in the book are kind of representatives or placeholders for larger communities of people that were sort of operating the same spaces at the same time. They're sort of thematic. Also, ironically, it would probably make a great CD-ROM. <laughs> yes, I know. I really <laughs> wanted to, I honestly seriously talked to my editor about doing either a floppy or a CD-ROM, uh, but 
We have no hard sell. To, to Publishing <laughs> is tough. I mean, we could buy it as a novelty object, but I'm not even <laughs> sure I have any disk drive at home oh, anymore. Oh, you can get a USB floppy drive or CD-ROM drive on Amazon for pretty cheap. Well, that's worth it. They still yeah. make them. Just Should we? So can we know. get some house lights up? Can we see if we have some questions from the room? We have people running around with microphones as ever, so we need some patience. Oh, there's a lot of you. Wow. Oh. wow. Yeah, I know. Like, there's a lot of you. What's I'm glad they turn the lights what's off. What's on your mind, good folks? What are your questions? Did we have a question yes. right here? Yes. Uh, just a, a sec. Uh, just a wait for. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it was just a comment. Okay. The comment is that this was great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, does anyone actually have a question? <laughs> oh, we got one right there. Right there. Yes. Uh, the mic is right there. Yeah. Um, are there any examples um, that you know of in which people tell the story of teams well? <sighs> no. <laughs> Honestly, no. I, I don't know. I, I don't think I've read a history that really pulls it off. Um, I wish there was. Maybe maybe books aren't the medium for it. Maybe television is the medium for it, or cinema. I mean, there's certainly something to be said for the way that narratives play out in really complex ways in uh, you know episodic television. Maybe that maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Have you guys seen *Halt and Catch Fire*? Mm -hmm. no. It's. I don't. It didn't make it over here. It was a really good TV show about computing history that told the story of four people. That's pretty good. But no, honestly, no. I, I, I think it's a, a goal that we should all aim towards. <laughs> or at least we should always read sort of individual-centric historical narratives with an, a knowledge of or an eye to the fact that those people were never alone. Well, but I mean, part of it is also about how we tell our own stories. There's something here that we're sort of circling around, which mm -hmm. is how do we think about or how do we like narrativize our own work environments as well, where especially I think if you work I mean, probably, if you're here, you work with something that involves more than one human. Quite a lot yeah. of us do, and, and we do work in those teams. And it's still difficult to, to make the story even of what we do day to day yes. in a constructive way yes. somehow. Yes. <laughs> That's a good point. Fishing for solutions. No. Okay. No, but, but the, the you were also talking about, about the early hypertext environment. Yeah. That's this sort of multidisciplinary environment that didn't necessarily require um, a hard computer sciences background. And I, I mean, I was very young, but I remember this vaguely that when postmodernism became fashionable, like, a, like critical theory was like really fashionable in mm -hmm. the late 80s and 90s. Like if you read newspapers, if you read culture sections, you would be interested in like the theory of hypertext, which is just like, what? Yeah, academics went crazy for it. So it, was very, it was very big in sort of literary spaces as well. This idea that you could write like a non-linear narrative was very exciting to a lot of people. And there were many attempts made to do good non-linear sort of branching narrative, I think, to various levels of success. Um, actually, t I, there's a whole chapter in the book about hypertext, and one of the people I don't talk about is a woman who existed in this space like in a more sort of creative way. And she told me that the reason that hypertext never really took off as a narrative form is because no one ever wrote like a trashy novel. You know, <laughs> everyone was trying to do like elevated POMO theoretical stuff. <laughs> Nobody wrote like a crime novel or a romance novel or something that people could connect with. Um, which is kind of an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, certainly, I grew up playing CD-ROM games and reading choose-your-own-adventure books, so it was a mania in the 90s. And I mean, we have the, like so such a big section of digital games today, of course, yeah. are, are constructed like that, so in a way that medium survived, but it didn't become a literary Yes, medium. it did not become literary. Well, maybe games are kind of literary now, so it's well, all yeah. come full circle. So, but I mean, I guess the question is why, since the internet is now everything, and in everything, and tech is in everything, and therefore touches like every surface of human life. Mm -hmm. Why don't we have more diverse teams now? Because we do care. Mo we do do all of those things. People, are, I mean, people, people are always like, "Oh, I read your book, and it's so men ruined everything." But it's just money ruined everything. You know, like when you are trying to build products and platforms, and your only goal is to, you know, be a be a cash vampire and monetize quickly and IPO and build new things. And you know, it's you're not. There's no motivation to build teams that are going to build like a holistic system that adequately reflects the communities that it's meant to serve. It's just like, it's much more sort of a tactical and draconian and I don't know, the motivations aren't right for, mm -hmm. for the kind of diversity that's necessary to build genuinely meaningful things, I think. Um, not to be super cynical and not to necessarily make an association between men and capitalism, although... Um, <laughs> <laughs> although history... <laughs> Yeah, I, I was hoping. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, oh, damn it. 
this is hard because also I, I always feel like with the moment we start talking about these things, we end up in some kind of raging anti-capitalist country. I know. And I it's know. not it's not my intention, but like surely we could make money still, even though we spent a little bit more of the development time on like fi figuring out the better way to do oh, something. Oh, we got a question. Yes. Do you know how to make money? <laughs> Without hurting anybody? There's the, uh, there's the microphone right there, yes. First, I would love to have that fixed for Mist because I still haven't <laughs> made through the whole way through that game. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I'm thinking it's interesting that you're saying that we shouldn't do, do hi describe history through individuals, mm -hmm. but still that's pretty much what you're doing. I know. Um, I would love to hear how would you describe Describe the pioneering grandmothers of the internet through like mo movements or trends or theorems or subcultures or yeah totally I mean I think the book is structured more that way than the talk I mean obviously mm -hmm. like the way that you, one structures this kind of thing it's helpful to have characters but um, you know I like to think about yes movements like evolutions in the history and it's funny because I think I mean whatever my conclusion after the research that I've done is that women tend to turn up at the very beginnings of these major movements like at the very beginning of programming they came along they sort of articulated the dimensions of what that field was and then as soon as it became important it was sort of drifted away from them you see the same thing in the emergence of hypertext the emergence of online community building moderation um, you know like even like early sort of like media online like the first sort of content websites were tended to be founded by women uh, like this the sort of information structure of the early internet itself, like the first people to sort of think about how to archive and structure and divide up the domains of the actual internet were sort of information scientists that were working as essentially librarians um, at this early point, and it wasn't really until they articulated the dimensions of that, that like, oh, we live in an information age. That's, we should, that's the important part of the internet, not the hardware. So there are these sort of larger thematic movements that women tend to sort of poke up in the beginning, usually when there's no precedent or context, you know, I think it's always, it's always easier to break into a field when that field has just been formed, right? It's much more difficult to find space in a field when it's got an established canon, it's got academics, and it's got, you know, people are making money already. Um, so you see a lot of women in the sort of early movements of these different phases and, and eras in the evolution of technology. So there are, there are these sort of trends, and there are characters within those trends, but uh, yeah, I don't know if that really answers your question, but it's something. Mm -hmm. There's the question there. There was. Yes. Can I see? I, I can't see the microphone. There we are. Just wave, wave vigorously so they can see you. There we are. Yes. Hi. 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 Um, I really loved your talk. Um, I was wondering whether you have some ideas and suggestions on. You, you said to reestablish the natural order of things. <laughs> <laughs> like it would be enough <laughs> to show pictures of men cooking and uh, women at. <laughs> 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 well, I think. I think one of the things that I come up against a lot is this sort of um, division between back-end and front-end or technical track jobs and more sort of user-oriented jobs. Like we still, I think in, in tech today, there's still this idea that like the front-end is the soft part and the back-end is the hard part and the hard part is what, where there are opportunities for advancement. It's where there are opportunities for you know celebrity in the tech sector, whereas the front-end is the sort of like thing that's tacked on. Um, and because of that, there, there's a lot of gender division between front and back end. And I think, I don't really know exactly how we get around this, but I think as, if we as a culture can start thinking about the user facing side of things as being as technical and as fundamentally technical and worthy of you know, technical accomplishment and credit uh, as the back end and vice versa, then I think we're better off. And I think, like, you know what I mean? When we, when we sort of soften the divisions between those two things, um, then I think we allow men the possibility of working in, that s in traditionally female spaces and we allow women the possibility of working in traditionally male spaces and everybody wins in that, uh, in that scenario. You know what I mean? I think we gotta like tackle the definition of the jobs and then, and then that opens more doors than trying to think about like how to get it from the other side. That's great. We have a question there, and then we can go up there, and oh then like if we now there's can questions. come down. Yeah, no, that's so we 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 warm up slowly. Do we have a microphone on this side? Yes. Can I just have just you are second from the edge? If you wave a little bit, there we are. Oh, there. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Oh, well. oh. thank you. <laughs> I was trying to give it to you, but okay. Give it to the lady. Okay, no, he go. He was, he was first. <laughs> okay. Okay, you go first. All right. Meritocracy. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, <laughs> first of all, thank you for a great talk. Thank you. I was uh, wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on, on that moment. It, it feels, at least in your talk, like a quite defining moment when, when Tim Berners-Lee, as you say, 
uh, sort of embeds his idea on the backbone of, of the internet. Why was it that it was the inferior product that got embedded? Mm. Well, it was simpler. It was simpler and it was free. I mean, it's always the same stuff. The thing about these early hypertext systems is that they were super, super sophisticated, but they ran on specialized equipment sometimes, and they tend to be locked into closed computer systems, so like you know, academic networks or you know, a set of computers within a research lab. Uh, I think that they could have that technology could have scaled to the internet given time and the right resources. But Tim Berners-Lee kind of got into this very tactical moment and presented a radically simplified alternative and put it on the backbone of the internet. And people at the time, I mean, the internet was at that you know. 1991 was still not something that most people use, but because he was working at a research lab that had you know, thousands of people working across disparate spaces, also internationally, um, he needed a way to communicate things quickly between people. So he was already thinking about the internet when maybe other people weren't. Um, I mean, part of the cynicism that people in hypertext had when he came along was, oh, well, no one is, you know, it's too expensive to use, to put it on the internet, no one's gonna use that. Um, so, he, I mean, he had that vision that it would get cheaper as well. And, you know, the network effect, right? I mean, he put it on the, on the internet and it became something that people had access to. And then, you know, as soon as you knew someone that was on the web, then you got on the web and it, it, it's, it snowballed in that way. Um, there are, it's interesting, I mean, if you get really into the weeds of this history, there are a lot of these early hypertext systems that tried to kind of like glom on to the web in different ways. Like Microcosm had a web viewer. So you could surf the web through Microcosm and then connect websites to documents on your own desktop. So you could make like this meta web that connected the web to your to your computer system. Uh, but ultimately, that didn't have mass adoption, so it didn't really make it. That's fantastic because, of course, if you're in the Google ecosystem, essentially that's how our yeah, of course. I mean, of course, now. it's so yeah. ahead of its time. I mean, like those kind of hypertext concepts, it's, it's embedded in everything. Like the way that you know our iCal like sees dates in our email and makes links between them. I mean, that's hypertext in the sort of earlier sense. Mm -hmm. But the, also the other sort of sad thing that we lost with the web is this idea of constructive hypertext. So in the early days of hypertext, it was as much about building links as it was about traveling on them. Like you would work your way through this information and you would be the one making the connections between things. And then you could share those trails or those associative paths with other people and they would be able to see like how you moved through information, like you know how you move through like a Wikipedia deep dive or whatever. Um, and that's like this really lovely sort of you know, community-oriented, human-oriented, deeply idiosyncratic thing that I wish was still part of the web. I mean, we share, but that sharing is mediated. By and the only people who do that are the advertisers. They know. <laughs> yes. Do we, we do we have a question right here somewhere? Yes. Yes, yes it, it is, is her turn. Let's do it you as well. Yes, I thought it was going to come back. Go right ahead. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Uh, I was just wondering, because you say that the internet is not your country anymore, mm -hmm. but what the internet is big tech is big so what is your home in the internet and also what do you think mm. is are like uh, the echo and the microcosm of today mm. and i hope you don't say pinterest <laughs> <laughs> well there's a panel all about that tomorrow uh i love arena shout out to arena um no it's hard i mean i think i don't know that i have a home on the internet really there's websites that i like and there's like projects that i think are interesting but Ultimately, there's no place where I'm like, oh, you know, I want to log in at the end of a long day and get into it with, you know, my friends on Reddit. Like, that's not <laughs> happening. <laughs> but I think it's also a consequence of the fact that, you know, I think in the, in the early days, the internet was still like an other thing. Like, it was something that you could go to, escape to. Um, it was a place where you could sort of define yourself in relationship to your everyday meat space life. Now we don't really have that division at all. It's all one thing. And so, I don't know, like it's, it's much more fluid in a sense and I think I'm much more interested in defining my identity you know, in, in space rather than online space these days. Yeah. Even we're losing the expressions. I mean, I'm, I would say away from keyboard or IRL and I think like my friends who are like 22, that's, those concepts are not meaningful to them. Yeah, what's a keyboard exactly? <laughs> also that. <laughs> okay, let's do, did you, here we are. Let's do at least one more question there. Yes, is the microphone coming? Keep waving, keep waving. We're pointing at you. Yeah, there. You. Yes. You, the front, the, the further <laughs> of the two of you. There's a person behind you also waving. And unfortunately, we can talk shades, after so too. I mean, I'll be here all yes. day. Hi, Go right um, ahead. I'm Leah, also from New York. Thank you oh, so much hi. From the, for the talk. Um, you brought a very, um, you brought up a very interesting concept of care. Um, and unfortunately, as you mentioned, a lot of products nowadays are patched 
on top mm -hmm. and not having care as a fundamental aspect um, of their build. If you imagine Instagram, you know, instead of the cognitive overload and instead of the notifications that completely break your life every 10 seconds, mm -hmm. they would really prioritize important things. So I was wondering if in your research you found um, any artifacts of that care that are important to bring up to the surface and maybe could be useful uh, for people who are designing products nowadays, if, if the question makes sense. Yeah, it totally you. makes sense. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, again, comes down to the values of the people making the products, right? Instagram punishes with the notifications because it wants us to be on the platform as much as possible so that it can sell us, it can sell us to each other and to advertisers. So as long as that is the business model, I don't think it's fundamentally pos even remotely possible um, to make <laughs> a system that doesn't hurt people. Um, I think it's good, you know, I think as users, we can be empowered in terms of how we use those platforms, uh, I think that's where the care is, ultimately, is between each other, coming up with coping strategies and mechanisms for using the internet more humanely and more sanely. But it's not going to come from on high. I think it's going to have to come from the ground up. Well, I think in that case, I'm going to steal the last question, because when we think about what happened, what happened to these women, how does, when we say a field drifts away from them, what is it that actually happens in physical space? And I guess it's people in rooms. And, and it's a lot of women just being bullied in spaces, you know, and yeah. a lot of people being not listened to and talked over and all of those things as well. Yeah. And there, I do feel that we have made progress. Like, there is a, a kind of, the history perhaps bent, to wo bent towards wokeness at least a little bit. <laughs> so the question is, do we... <laughs> I mean, but it does so, at least for now, inside this, this sort of meta layer of, of this incredibly aggressive capitalism. Mm -hmm. So is it enough that we're better at being nice to each other? Have, are we, have we basically solved this now? Mm. Or do we still need to fight for, the, for women to be heard in these spaces? I mean, I think let's opt on the side of fighting for women for a little while longer, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit. Um, and, you know, everyone, everyone that needs to be heard, people of color, any marginalized community, like, if you are in a space where you have the power to am amplify someone else's voice and what you're saying is not important, <laughs> like, give it, please give it to somebody else to say. <laughs> um, it's just a good rule. There's enough time to talk about everything, you know? Like, you can get your point in, just not first, not loudest, just there. Uh, and be open, I think. But yeah, no, I think, I mean, maybe we've solved it in interpersonally, perhaps, I hope, but we certainly haven't solved it in terms of the discourse online. I mean, we're certainly, st everyone, we, people are still getting yelled down on every corner of the internet every moment all around us. So I think we still need to work on that. That is true. Yeah. We need Sorry, to. I, uh, you wanted to end it on a positive note. Yes, but then I forgot about the internet, which is literally what we're talking about. So here we are. No, Dear friends, yeah. Clara Levens. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much.